بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد The date is September 20th, 2020 and we are beginning our first podcast of this series which is titled Kashkul Colloquia Islamica A Kashkul for those who are unfamiliar with this is seen as a beggar's bowl, which would be carried by a dervish or an ascetic individual. And oftentimes after a street performance of poetry or religious eulogies, he would be given sweets and an assortment of things like money. And based on that, there is a famous book of the scholar Sheikh Bahauddin al-Amali, commonly known as Sheikh Bahai, titled The Kashkul where he has an assortment of different conversations. So taking inspiration from this object and from this book, we have this series where we seek to speak about different facets of Islamic civilization. I have the honor to be joined by my dear friend and mentor, Dr. Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmad, who did his master's from Indiana University and his PhD in nearest studies from Princeton. Dr. Nizam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. It's a pleasure, as always. Uh, alhamdulillah, pleasure. Uh, alhamdulillah. So, today's topic, <clears throat> yeah. uh, considering that the month of Safar just started and we indeed, are in the indeed, days of yeah. mourning Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and the martyrdom of the Imam in Karbala, the topic which you so excellently suggested was a discussion over the maqatil literature and the sources about the martyrdom of Imam al Hussein. Because this question is something which is often asked, you know, I've traveled to various communities and this is yep. something which is asked, and you have taught several students across the world. And I'm sure this is a commonly asked question for you. So, would you like to say some introductory words about this genre of literature, defining this genre and its importance? Yes, I think that the um, body of writings generally referred to as maqatil mm -hmm. are extremely important. And I think that they are to some degree neglected, certainly in Western uh, scholarship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm only aware of this one article, which is pretty old, from the Journal of Arabic Literature. <clears throat> that would be volume 25, which would be in 1994. And... Um, it was written by uh, Sebastian Gunther, and it's simply titled Maqatil Literature in Medieval Islam, and it runs from pages 192 to 212. And beyond this, I don't know if there's been any extensive work done on this genre. And uh, although there are writings in Arabic that look at the deaths, usually very violent, uh, of a number of individuals. Maqatil is almost synonymous in Arabic as a genre with the accounts of the uh, martyrdoms. If you like, you could even call it a kind of martyrological literature, but the martyrdoms of <clears throat> the uh, family of the Prophet وسلم, and even the more extended branches of the Banu of the of the Prophet's family, um, in the sense of you know, lineal descendants of Imam Ali, the Talib Alids or Talib Talibids, mm -hmm. but um, in terms of a definition, uh, if you really wanted to come up with a, a strict definition of what is meant by maqatil or what is a maqtal, I would simply say it would be um, a an account. Mm -hmm. And here I would really insist on it being a written account. A martyrdom account or a martyrdom narrative. An, an account, yes, in the sense an account in the sense of a narrative of the death of someone yeah, or the because, martyrdom of someone. Because maktal in Arabic literally, you know, we call it ismul makan, the it's place an where an action is carried out, the action of slaughter or killing. Exactly. So it could be in the sense of an ismul makan, but could also by 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 that by by extension mm -hmm. refer to a a, a a a book or a writing talking about that. And in terms of maqatil, you know, we find standalone works, and um, I think that um, the famous Shi'i bibliographer, generally known as Aqa Buzurg, uh -huh. and sometimes they turn the Qaf into a Ghain, but it's Aqa Buzurg, they say Aqa Buzurg Tahrani, I think it was Muhammad Mahsan al-Tahrani, uh, author yes. of Al-Dhari'a ila Tasanif al-Shi'a, 
he lists, I think, what, 59 such texts in his Adhariya. Um, and uh, you would also find a number of titles uh, having the word maqtal, whether it's the maqtal of Imam Hussein, of course, which would be the most famous, yes. naturally. Uh, other people who had uh, particularly graphic, um, not just deaths, mind you. It's not just that the person is killed. It's not just that the person is martyred. But there is also the dimension often, especially in the case of Zayd ibn Ali. Yes, and we have works, the Maqtal of Zayd, for Precisely. example. Precisely, there's a Maqtal of Zayd. And there's also Zayd's son, Yahya. And yes. Zayd ibn Ali is, of course, Zayd ibn Ali. Yes. Known as Zayn al-Abidin ibn al-Husayn, mm-hmm. alayhim mm-hmm. salam And of course, there is the the um, desecration uh, in a ritual fashion, mind you, as a form of ritual humiliation of the sacred remains of the martyred individual. And that often, especially for the Banu Umayyah, took the form of crucifixion. Posthumous crucifixion, mind you. Once, Because t- generally speaking, the body of the slain, of the martyred individual, the, the head would be severed. Yes. There would be a, a decapitation, and then the head would be presented to the ruler um, in question. And that's really, it's, it's quite, there's, it's, it's, it's a striking similarity, culturally speaking, with um, the samurai, the, the Japanese um what shall we call it, martial tradition mm-hmm. and traditions of, 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 uh, of warfare and, and uh, ritual honor and revenge. They were also, if, you know, for want of a better term, a headhunting society in that sense. Yeah, so. And so th- that would also take place. I'm not aware of crucifixion. I think crucifixion may have, may have been introduced in Japan after the arrival of the Catholics. But of course, in the context of Islam, it is a phenomenon and in fact, it is a late antique phenomenon and has a late antique context. And, this, and in this regard, I would like to um, bring to your attention. Um, this is, not a, this is a, not a very recent book, but it's still pretty recent. It was published, uh, it says copyright 2014, <coughs> excuse me. And that's Crucifixion and Death as Spectacle, Umayyad Crucifixion in its Late Antique Context by Sean Anthony. I just got a hold of this book and I'm reading through it, so it's absolutely fascinating. So anyway, to sum up, I would say that uh, that uh, then um, uh, Maqtal is a kind of account of these kind of events. Yes. And you can have two kinds, I would say, really. Probably two, two major um, um, types of Maqtal writing or literature I would distinguish. One would be um, the attempt at, at presenting a, a merely historical account and of course, this isn't history in the sense of a connected thematic account. It's the it's the it's the collection and putting together of akhbar, uh, you know, accounts which are originally oral and they are recorded in writing. And of course, the most famous maqtal in this re- of this type would be the maqtal of Abu Mihnaf yes. Lut ibn Yahya. Yeah, yeah. And then you have a kind of more thematic connected account which really, I think, was meant to be read out loud and recited as, a, as an oral performance. Uh, there's an oral performance and, dimension. And I think that's a very important point because yeah. there's no other historical genre, whether it is the genre very of Maghazi good. and the military expeditions or the Sira of the Prophet that had this devotional form of recitation. I, yeah, I think that's a brilliant point because you're absolutely right. I mean, if you look at the Sira of, of Ibn Ishaq, in the recension of Ibn Hisham, so almost everyone calls it the Seerah of Ibn Hisham. Mm-hmm. You again, you don't have exactly a kind of thematic account. You've got various akhbar and it's all put stitched together mm-hmm. in the recension of Ibn Hisham. But it's an attempt to present a sacred history. It's a hiero history exactly. of sorts, right? <clears throat> <clears throat> Where the the <clears throat> birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is against the back, backdrop of Absolutely. of the Ibrahimi, you know, Abrahamic transmission. Yes, and then you've got like the Maghazi literature, Muhammad ibn Umar al-Waqidi. Again, those mm-hmm. are, you can't imagine those things being recited. Later, of course, you have a Mawlid genre where, where you know, account, you know, the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is there 
and there will be bits of poetry like from the Burda and, and there will be a kind of nasheed or singing element of all of that. So it's something more like that. So in the maqtal, maqatil literature, you also have, for example, the maqtal of um, Sayyid Radhuyuddin ibn Tawus, known as Al-Malhuf ala Qatl al tufuf In fact, recently I was looking for a recitation of that online. I couldn't find one. And you posted one recitation so of yourself. I, I, yes, yeah, yes, so yes, I, yes, I, I took the plunge and I thought, okay, let me, let me just try this. Uh, but that is a very beautiful account and you can see from the very beginning because of the way it's written you know there's there's a saja element there's a rhymed prose that this was meant to be performed <clears throat> or read out loud in some in some fashion and you find mm -hmm. that in other languages islamicate languages or languages used by muslims such as in persian and i believe the thing in shocking thing is <laughs> if <laughs> I mean, it seems more shocking now in our in our immediate contemporary reality in light of what's going on in the Muslim world right now, that the author of this this collection, this maqat, this maqtal, is a Sunni, and that's um, <clears throat> why, why is Kashifi. Yes. Rawdatul Shuhada. Rawdatul Shuhada, right, because it's a, it's it's in Persian. Yes, of course, yes. the Arabic title uh. will be Rawdatul Shuhada, but it's Rawdatul Shuhada, from which you get this this idea in Persian language of Rawdatul or Ruze Khani, yes, yes. the recitation of the Rawdatul Shuhada. And that book was even done translated into Turkish. I did not know that. By Fuzuli. Fuzuli, yes. Fuzuli is a very important poet. And it was known as um, <clears throat> in its Turkish version as Hadiqat Suada. And there are some really good manuscripts. In fact, I have a very good manuscript of it, which I got from the um, Mevlana uh, Turbesi and Muzesi, you know, the, the the shrine of Jaladin Rumi's uh, library and shrine and um uh, in in uh, Konya, and that was from the personal collection of a very famous Turkish Shi'i scholar. And it's very important to point out he was Shi'i because Lewis, the famous author of this book on Rumi, lists him as a great scholar of Rumi, which he was, and he says he's a Sunni, which is just simply not true. I've been to his tomb. He's buried in the Shia cemetery in Istanbul on the Asian side mm. in Üsküdar on uh, Sayyid Ahmed Jadisi, and I've, and I've been to his grave, and he was definitely a Shi'i. So, um, Hadiqat al Suada in the uh, Abdul Baki Gulpin Ali collection, and even Abdul Baki Gulpin Ali has this uh, book, for example, Yeni Gulzare Hasenain in Turkish, Karbala Vakesi. You know, he gives the whole account of what happened at Karbala, and he has his own uh, poetic works, uh, Makatil type works, which he wrote in his own handwriting, which I have seen in that library, mind you. Um, and they are in the Arabic original way, uh, you know, writing system of Ottoman. So uh, that should give you an idea of this huge sort of uh, genre. I should also add that in India, in Urdu, there was also a tradition of writing also among, among Sufi-minded Sunnis um, of accounts of the martyrdom of uh, Imam Hussein in particular, and they're very poetic compositions, and they're usually called Shahadat Nama. And there's all sorts of Shahadat Namas floating around, and some of them are actually in manuscript. I've, I had the good fortune of seeing some many years ago on a visit to Lucknow in the library of some of the um, uh, notable families of the Firangi Mahal uh, mm. um, clan, if we may call that, yes. So, <laughs> so uh. it's a very important area. Well, you just, uh, you referred to Al-Mahluhuf ala Qatl al-Tufuf by uh, Sayyid ibn Tawus. So there's a very interesting edition, a critical <laughs> edition, which was published uh, by a Sheikh Faris Tabrizian, who was famously known as Al-Hassoun. Right. And there's a very interesting list that he mentions. Right, and in that right. list, he mentions 32 maqatil, which were written before Sayyid ibn Tawus's work over here. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, the first maqtal, <clears throat> which he mentions, which even predates Abu Mekhnaf, yeah, is the maqtal of the companion of Imam Ali by the name of Al-Asbagh bin Nubata. Of course, Al-Asbagh, you know, famous companion, was part of the Shurtatul Khamis, the elite uh, task force of Imam Ali, a group of 6,000 companions. Correct, correct. So, I mean, it, it seems, though, that there are no traces of this maqtal which survives even in later historical accounts because many of these maqatil which he lists, he admits that we only know of their names. The actual text of the maqatil as itself does not survive, 
but the only surviving factors we have is through the narrations of other individuals. Yeah. For example, <clears throat> the maktal of Abu Mekhnaf is found mainly in Tabari's recording, and later on it was used by Sheikh Al Mufid and other individuals. Yeah, yeah. So, is there any insight that you can shed on the maktal of Al Asbagh bin Nubata? Well, like Hassoun says here in the introduction, وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ الْمَقَاتِلَ الْقَدِيمَةِ لَمْ يَبْقَى مِنْهَا إِلَّا الْإِسْمِ So most of the ancient maqatil works, all we know is their names. حُرِقَتْ وَسُرِقَتْ وَتُلِفَتْ You know, they were burned, or they were you know stolen, or they've just been or they've damaged. Just, just damaged and you know fallen apart and, and, and have uh, just decayed and been lost through the passage uh, of time. Um, I don't know if this this uh, it, you know, survives anywhere in manuscript. I mean, it, the only listing we know is there. It's in al Zariya and al Fihrist, of course. The, the reference yes, here by Ibn to Fihrist is Ibn, uh, Ibn Nadim, who, uh, if you don't know, he was a Shi'i as well. Yes, yes. Um, and we should mention that it is contested what the date of al Asbah bin Nubata's death was. For example, uh, Correct, uh, Sayyid yeah. Mosan al Amin in his Ayyan al Shia says that he was martyred on the day of Safin. So uh, that you know, raises a lot of different questions as well. That's true. That's true. That raises a lot of questions. Um, in the context, though, of Abu Mikhna, whom mm. you very rightly mentioned, <clears throat> um, actually, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that in the seminal, if I'm not mistaken, in the seminal um, study of the emergence of Tashayya as a phenomenon by S.H.M. Ja'afari, The Origins and Early Development of Shia, Islam, he mentions, I think, three or four manuscripts of the Maqtal of Abu Mikhnaf. Actually, it's probably good to refer to that. Let's uh, just find that detail. One of them, anyhow, is in Berlin. One of the manuscripts I'm sure he mentions is in Berlin. Another one is in Gotha, Gotha collection, and the other one is probably Leiden. Um, the martyrdom of Hussein. Yeah. So he says here on page 215 of the same work, Origins and Early Development of Shia Islam. I have the 1990 reprint. Uh, published at Beirut of the Librairie du Liban, page 215. He mentions of the Maqtal four manuscripts. One is located at Gotha, G O T H A, number 1836. Berlin in the Sprenger collection, number 159 to 160. And I'm going to have something to say about that. Leiden, number 792. And then uh, Sankt Petersburg, St. Petersburg, it says A-M-N-O, I'm not sure what that stands for, AM number 78. Now, it's from the Gotha manuscript and the Berlin manuscript, according to Professor Ja'afari, rahimahullah, that Ferdinand Wüstenfeld, famous German Orientalist, made a translation, and he published it, gosh, how do we read this in German? Der Todd des Hussein ben Ali und die Rache, Göttingen, 1883. <laughs> okay, so that's an old book. I won't actually... attempt to read it. I'll leave that to you. <laughs> yeah, I don't, don't know if I did that right, but it's it was published in Göttingen in 1883. I've never seen this book. I mean, I would love to get a copy of this. You know, maybe maybe someone has a PDF. You know, Sajad Rizvi, if you're listening, send us a PDF. Um, so... Yeah, I would love to see that, but um, uh, this manuscript from from uh, from Berlin, which is list, listed as Sprenger one fit one five nine one to two one six zero, I got a hold of this manuscript. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I was absolutely fascinated by this, and I think that this manuscript, the Berlin manuscript, I first heard of it from my teacher uh, Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Al Husseini Al Jalali, who now mm. resides in Chicago. May Allah preserve him. <clears throat> And I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the same manuscript is mentioned by um, the scholar uh, Sheikh. Uh, um, uh, is it Yusuf Al Gharawi or Al Yusuf Al Yusuf Al Gharawi? I don't remember if they Arabized the name. Right, but, but he's got a book with that title. Right, it's called. Um, um, it's no, he calls it Maqtal al Taf or something. No, no, Waqat al Taf. Waqat al Taf. Excuse me. Lilut bin Yahya. Yeah. So he's he mentions the Berlin manuscript as well. Yes, yes. 
So I had someone get it for me because I was always fascinated by this because it's Sprenger. Now, Alois Sprenger was a German Orientalist and he was in India. And when you actually get the manuscript, you see his signature on it. And basically he got it from the personal library of Wajid Ali Shah, uh, the, his Royal Highness, uh -huh. Wajid Ali Shah, <laughs> the last <laughs> sovereign of Lucknow. Of Avad, we should say, uh, like no being the, the capital. State, yes. And um, of, unfortunately, the manuscript was a little disappointing. It doesn't appear to be that old, but I guess that's what we have. Um, so that's an interesting fact, but I think there's still... I think we should still be optimistic because there are discoveries of manuscripts that are made all of the time. And if something which is very interesting... So something might come to light. ...is that uh, Faris Tabrizian, yeah. he mentions that there is a maktal which predates Sayyid ibn Taus by right. somebody named Ahmad bin Abdullah al-Bakri. Yeah. And he says, Tujadu nuskhatun minhu fi maktabati jami'at al-Qaraviyin fi madinati Fas. So in Morocco and Fas and, you know, the University of Qaraviyin, which, if I remember correctly, was established by Fatima al-Fahri. Is that? Oh, okay. I don't, okay. But That's it, a it's, side uh, It's a side note, yeah, but it's a very ancient, you know, there's, the, uh -huh. it's a very ancient university there and that would be certainly worth uh, trying to get a hold and of. And I, I know you have had your own uh, encounters with people in Morocco, particularly in relation yep. to the Hassani Sadat and the different... Oh, yes, yes. You yes. know, so it's interesting that there is a maktal of Imam al Hussein which reaches Morocco and the manuscript is found over there. What, what page is that on? I don't see it. What's the date? The date for this is... It, Abu it is number nine on oh, Faris Tabrizian's okay. list yeah, over here. Number nine is here on yes. page 35. Haditu wafati Sayyidina al Hussein. No, what page is that on? The number nine is... The, the page is 35. Hmm. Page 35 at the bottom, number nine on his list. This is Lahu Kitab Maqtal Abi Abdullah al Hussein. You have a different edition. Uh, huh, so my, uh, mine is. Uh, oh no, it continues on. It's 36. Uh, tu Jadu Nuskhatun. Tu Jadu Nuskhatun minu fi Maqtal Jamat al Qarawin fi Madinat Fasal 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 and seeing Ahmad ibn Abdullah al-Bakri, but we don't have any further details here on him. Yes, it's a very brief list. I'm sure that it, that if one went through uh, manuscript catalogs, you may well be able to to come up with an even more exhaustive list. And all of these obviously would be worthy of examination and further mm. study. And I hope that someone out there who hears this podcast and uh, you know sees themselves as qualified for this task, that they should... Inshallah. Uh, embark upon it with the name of Allah. Inshallah. And, uh, so, yeah, that would be fantastic to look at. And you're absolutely right. There is a, there is an amazing sort of um, 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 of veneration for the Ahlul Bayt, the Sada, in Morocco. I've never actually been to that country, but I have met <clears throat> many people from Morocco. I've had colleagues and friends from that part of the world. And in this context, I mean, this isn't Maqata literature, but there's an extraordinary book called Salwatul um, Anfas Fi Man Uqbira Bifas. It's quite a title. It's quite a title. And I have a, a three-volume lithograph edition of this. I'm, I'm sure it's been published in a, in a modern, with modern type and critical edition. But it's basically a, a book of biographies of notable people <clears throat> who are buried in Fez. Hmm. And a lot of them are Sada, and and you know from the family of the Prophet sallam, And in Morocco, they ref they don't really use the title Sayyid. A lot of times in some of the uh, Arab countries, they would use the title Ash Sharif as well. Like yes, you know the yes, famous yes. one in our tradition is Ash -shir Sharif al Murtaba. Uh, but in history, there have been others like Ash Sharif al Jurjani, and you know stuff like people like that. But in Morocco, they use the word, they take the word Mola and they say Al Mola so and so. But they just pronounce it as Moulay. So there's, in Fez, there's the famous tomb of Moulay Idris. And, yes. you know, the current monarch of Morocco, he is reputed to, I, I don't know the details, I'm not a Nasaba, I'm not a scholar of genealogy, I'm looking to, but he's reputed to be from uh, the Hassanid line. And there is a very interesting group of scholars also from Morocco, the Rimari clan, Al-Rimari. And there, there's different, there's, 
I get them all mixed up because there, there's a bunch of different brothers. But they have also written famous books, which which are of a thoroughly, shall we say, shiri bent of mind in the sense shiri, not in the sense of you know following Shia aqidah and fiqh, uh, and, and fiqh and, but I would say in the sense of wala. Of, of love and loyalty. General inclination and love for Ahlul Bayt. Precisely. So the Ghimari clan, so like there's, a, there, there's a book, uh, al Fatwa Al-Ali, which is a, by one of these Muhaddith brothers talking about how the the Senate of the Hadith, Anam Madina Tul'im Wa Ali Yun Babuha, is a solid book, or so, is a solid Hadith. There's a book called Izalatul Khatar Fi Man Jama'a Bain as Salatain Fil Hadr, talking about how you can combine the prayers Maghrib and Isha in the time of either Maghrib or Isha or Dhuhr and Asr in the time of Dhuhr and the time of Asr, mm. which is a, you know, for want of a better term, a signature Shi'i practice, I <laughs> Absolutely, suppose. absolutely. So there is a lot of this um, kind of their, uh, you know, attitude there, or sorry, inclination, excuse yes. me. There's a lot of salawat works that have come out of there, like um, the Dalail al-Khayrat by al-Jazuli, which are these... Prayers on the Prophet So there's a lot of, lot of things, a lot of things like a lot okay. of devotional literature. Mm-hmm. So that it, that would not surprise me if there is a manuscript. And oddly enough, also, I mean, if we take um, maqatil not just as standalone works, but as parts of larger works. Yes. So yes. you've got the Tariq of Tabari. Yes. Yes. And they all, you know, in the Tariq of Tabari, all the maqatil are there. There's the Maqtul Imam Hussein is there, of course. Zaid would be there as well. Zaid ibn Ali. Um, and of course, uh, Hujr ibn Adi al Kindi is a very fulsome account of what happened to yes, Hujr ibn yes, Adi al Kindi there. So, similarly, you find the same sort of material, and I cannot stress it. And we should also mention that there's a maqtal of Uthman as well in the sources. Yes, this is true. This is true. And um, yeah, there are account that would also classify, uh, come under that, that uh, heading. That's certainly true. Um, there's whole accounts of that. So maybe and it's a, it's a uh, question to ask at this point yeah. is that it is not exclusive to a Shi'i practice to write on yeah, this no, genre. Yeah, no, that's right. That that I think uh, Gunter brings out pretty well, talking about how there are even works that talk about about personalities who had notable deaths that were suitably spectacular, for want of a better term, mm-hmm. to deserve um, being. Um, uh, you know, memorialized in some sort of a historical account, and they are from pre-Islamic times as well. But what I was going to say is, I can't stress how how important this book is. The the historical work of Al Baladuri, mm-hmm. and Sabu Al Ashraf, extremely important as well. And you'll find the same sort of material that's there in Tabari, and a lot of times, even better than what's in a Tabari, um, especially with regard to uh, um, matters relating to you know the, the, the what happened at the Saqifa, the Maqtal of Imam Hussein, all of the sort of contested historical. <laughs> Uh, events, yeah, so. but in the context, since you raised about about Al Maghrib, about the 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 um, about Morocco and North Africa, one of the complete manuscripts of this work is in Morocco as well. Interesting, interesting. And the other one, of course, is the famous uh, Raisul Kutab manuscript discovered by Muhammad Hamidullah. Uh, or if he didn't discover it, he certainly was the first person to start editing it. Which is uh, Raisul Kutab is in is is one of the Turkish collections in Istanbul. I have a digital copy of the whole thing. And anyhow, so I wanted to okay. just make that you know, point. it's uh, al kalam yajur al kalam, as they yajur, say, yes, yes. words lead to words. Yeah. So there's at this point, uh, I think maybe it would be appropriate to discuss the importance of Abu Mikhnaf, Lut bin Yahya, who he was. Yeah. His importance as a narrator, and maybe we should point out for our listeners. I was telling some people about this podcast, and many oh. were asking, "Will you discuss the specific?" historical differences in the Makati literature. That would be too long of a discussion. No, that a whole, would be, you know, get whole very, few hours. So yeah, we'll spare you of that trouble. But Very technical. I, I see that, you know, when it comes to Abu Mikhnaf, Lut bin Yahya, there's a lot of discussion about his date of birth and his date of death as well. I It seems that there is a consensus around the year 157. He passes yeah. away. But yeah. in terms of who he was, there it's an uh, interesting point to note that Sheikh Tusi, quoting Kashi, the famous uh, Rajal scholar, mm-hmm. that Kashi, quoting him, he says that Abu Mikhnaf was from amongst the companions of Imam Ali, which of course Sheikh Tusi he rejects, and he says that maybe we can say this about his father. So this is, these are you know some points in regards to that. 
But do you have any uh, light to shed upon who this individual was, his own inclinations in terms of his relationship with Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salam, yeah. as well as his importance as a narrator of history? Um, yeah, I don't know much about the difference. On, uh, I'm, I'm not familiar too much with the whole dispute about the death date. The death date, which I'm familiar with, is 157. 157 AH. 774. Yes, yeah, yes. 774 Gregorian. Um, well, he's extremely significant because he's the first person to produce a comprehensive account of of what happened at Karbala, the so-called Maqtal al Hussein alayhi salam. <clears throat> and of course, he has other works, but we're focusing on on Maqatil here. Um, he is even in Western scholarship regarded as one of the earliest and best Arab historians uh, by as early as as Julius Wellhausen, Julius Wellhausen or Julius Wellhausen, a very important scholar. Um, and, you know, he's also produced brilliant work on the authenticity of the Old Testament in a book called The History of Israel. Israel, of course, meaning Banu Israel here, because he was, I think that came out in the 19th century. And it's a very brilliant study of the whole documentary hypothesis uh, in Old Testament studies. And he brings a similar critical eye to an examination of the early Arab historical or uh, Arabic historical sources, and he has a really brilliant book which I think is still worth reading. Um, I'm not sure when it came out in German. In German, it was called Das Arabische Reich und sein Sturz, mm. and uh, I've only read the English translation, which was published by the University of Calcutta Press in the 20s. It's called The Arab Kingdom and His Fall. And there was a German scholar named uh, Ursula Sezgin. I think this should be the wife of Fuad Sezgin. Fuad Sezgin is, of course, the scholar who has given us the monumental multi-volume. It's like 10, 12 volume work. Uh, G-A-S. What does that stand for? Geschichte, Geschichte des Arabischen Schriftums, I think. Yeah, so it's the history of Arabic writing, but volume one is very significant for our purposes. And... and of course, he talks about Abu Mikhnaf there, and Ursula Sezgin wrote an entire work examining Abu Mikhnaf. And so uh, she and other scholars like Wellhausen have found him to be the most reliable and authentic writer on these events. And it's also relating to Kufa and Iraq and other events that took place there, uh, you know, under in the Umayyad period. He... Um, Took special. Uh, uh, he made he made he made concerted efforts to try and contact people who were still alive, who had witnessed the event, or were um, descendants of uh, such people. Now, the Maqtal of Abu Mihnaf appears. Again, we don't have it as a standalone work. We have quotations from it, and again, I have to. I always say this. Baladri is, is very important in this regard. Uh, Baladri died in 279, by the way, uh, which would be around 892 or 893. And so he predates, by death date anyhow, a tabari because a tabari also quotes from him. A tabari died in 310 of the Hijra. So his work, the Ansab al-Ashraf, is absolutely crucial. So he's quoted there. Now, surprisingly... Ibn Kathir as well, who is no friend of the Shia, also relies heavily on uh, on Abu Mihnaf in his book Al Bidaya wa Nihaya, in which mm-hmm. in which he gives the account of the the end of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, which uh, just shows you how uninformed, I suppose, is the word the great Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi is when he gave his famous Tennessee lecture in yes, twenty yes. whatever it was sixteen seventeen where he says, you know, I'm giving the Sunni account and Abu Mikhnaf is not reliable and he's a Shi'i and just trust my authority. Well, okay, you know, good luck to the people who are trusting his authority because even Ibn Kathir, basically, it doesn't matter who you are. You could be the most fanatical Wahhabi, but if you want to write an account... A historical account. An, an historical account, you have no choice but to rely Absolutely. on Abu Mikhnaf either directly or bilwasata because you're going to use baladri tabari oh. this is who you're going to use so um so um what i was going to say is that it seems that his work was diffused quite widely early on and naturally people were interested in this i mean the the, the martyrdom of imam hussein unlike what people would like you to lead would lead you to believe today you know because there's this whole effort to make people forget this event 
it was huge. And, and even saying that, it sounds like such an absurd understatement. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. it influenced literature. I mean, it was it was all over. And it's there in poetry as well. There's, in fact, a famous study. I have had it around here somewhere, but there's so many books piled up around here about um, <clears throat> about uh, uh, the history of Kufa, in fact, in literature. Uh, I forget the name of it now. There's, um, anyhow, and, and so it also talks about the, the centrality and importance of, um, of this event. So uh, you, you cannot downplay the event. So it was, so my point is, the point I'm trying to make is that the Maqtal of Abu Mikhnaf was um, widely spread. And so there are, it's a different riwayat of it as well. Now, it, it seems that At-Tabari um, quotes Abu Mikhnaf directly. And that's okay. an important point. That's when important I say point. directly, no, they didn't meet each other. I mean, he he had mm. some direct version um, without without intermediary. He had some written version of it that survived. His, it appears, okay? And the, because sometimes he just says Abu Mikhnaf, you know, he quotes from Abu Mikhnaf. But other times, in fact, often he cites Abu Mikhnaf via, via someone else. And that is Hisham ibn Muhammad al-Kalbi. Yes. Hisham ibn Muhammad al-Kalbi is also an extremely important historian in his own right. He has a famous book called Kitab al-Asnam, um, which is published and uh, was published in Cairo. It's been, and, and, and it was republished again from Abu Dhabi. And it's also based on a unique manuscript. I have that manuscript also. Uh, it was actually published by, was it Zaki Pasha? So I have that because it was his manuscript and now it's in Cairo. And that's a very important book as well. And also, just as by way of footnote, he also wrote a very important book, which a lot of people don't want to read today, called the Kitab al-Mathalib. <laughs> yeah. So Mathalib are, you know, uh, it's sort of the skeletons in the closet, you could uh -huh, say. You know. Yeah. yeah, so it's a whole, uh, so anyway, suffice it to say, it's a very uh, interesting work. Um, on the to the, say the least on on the um, you know very unflattering facts from the genealogical uh, you know from the ancestors of various of various uh, big mm. names in Islamic history. So Tabari relies on on Abu Mikhnaf either directly or through um, uh, Hisham ibn Muhammad al Kalbi al Baladuri also. Um, he seems to be doing the same sort of thing, at Tabari. But the thing is, he has he seems to have a more uh, ample quotation. That is to say, he 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 gives more accounts, more versions, you know, than you mm -hmm. find in Tab in Tabari. So the overall material, let's say, on the Maqtal of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Baladri, is more quantity wise. It's more detailed than than in other words, he has more akhbar on that than yes, Tabari yes, does. Yes. And speaking of the number and, of akhbar, I think uh, Yusufi al gharavis introduction in Waqa'at al-Taf yeah. is very useful because he actually makes a list and he categorizes the different narrators that Abu Mikhnaf narrates from. Yeah. So, for example, he counts, according to his count, that there were 39 people who narrate to Abu Mikhnaf the right. incident of Karbala. He says there are 65 total reports, uh -huh. and he categorizes them. For example, one category are those people who directly witnessed the event, and Abu Mikhnaf directly narrates from them. So that that's something which is very important, because he, Abu Mikhnaf is narrating from eyewitnesses towards the events of Karbala. Mm -hmm. Very important. Now, you want, speaking of eyewitnesses... Who is also a great eyewitness? Imam Ali Zain al Abidin. Absolutely. Al his his martyrdom was celebrated or commemorated, excuse me, very recently uh, in the whole sort of liturgical calendar. Um, but what is fascinating is that a Shaykh al Mufid, um, who dies in 413, which, uh, let's see, here's 1022, has a work known as Kitab al Irshad. Yes. And in the Irshad, the tragedy of Karbala, and we need to talk about the meaning of tragedy. I think and we, once we go through this, we should address this. But the tragedy, and let's just put that in quotes for now. We're yes, just using yes. it in the common usage of Karbala. <clears throat> he records, apart from Abu Mikhnaf, from 
other lines of narration that go back to Ali ibn al Hussein, in other words, Imam al Sajjad, also known as Zain al Abidin. So he would have been, what, 23 at the time of the whole uh, massacre yes. at of Muharram, uh, 10th of Muharram at Karbala. So it's interesting here to note what um, Jafari says about this. And I really think that Jafari's work is very neglected. And, uh, you know, people talk about Madalung and they talk about um, these other writers I mentioned, like Velhaus and so forth, but Madalung most recently. But his work is really neglected. So he says here on page 213 of his book, it is indeed very interesting and useful to note that in general outline and in all major events, the renderings of Sheikh al-Mufid, um, whom he describes as a very committed diehard Shihi, are closely paralleled by those of the Syrian Ibn Kathir. Very interesting. That's again. an interesting point. So... The fact that he's relying on Abu Mikhna, the fact that he's also relying on Ali Zayn al-Abidin, it's quite interesting. Uh, just a couple more facts about um, Abu Mikhna. Um, the time factor is really important, right? So we're not entirely sure exactly when he was born. But again, according to Professor Ja'fari, we know... Um, that at the rising of uh, Ibn al-Ash'ath against Hajjaj ibn Yusuf in the between the years uh, Hijra years 80 and 82 corresponding to 699 and 701 at that point in time Abu Mikhnaf had already reached manhood so the professor concludes that Abu Mikhnaf must have been born around the year that the event happened in Karbala so around the same, you know, that would be 61 of the Hijra. And that would make him around the time of the rising of uh, Ash'ath against Hajjaj between the ages of 18 and 22. Um, so he goes on to say, it is certain that many of those who took active part in the Battle of Karbala on the Umayyad side were still living. And thus the author had the opportunity of meeting and interviewing personally those who had witnessed the event themselves. And of course, you, you quoted already, from uh, Yusuf al gharawi the breakdown on that. Um, so it's a very important source. Uh, Abu Mikhnaf cites his authority with the clear observation, وَكَانَ قَدْ شَهِدَ قَتْلَ Hussein. He introduces many like, and so-and-so, or who witnessed the murder of Hussein. And throughout his text, throughout his narrative, excuse me, the, at least the quotations that we have, he uses the verb حَدَّثَنِي. He told me. So if this report is not directly from an eyewitness, he cites maybe one or two intermediaries. So he's pretty close. Which makes him temporally very and chronologically, very chronologically speaking. And um, so I just think there's no way you can you can uh, um, marginalize him as as as. You know, Salafist polemicists polemic, polemic, often do, and they say, well, you know, he's not reliable and he's just a malicious liar and so on and so, so forth. So why don't we get to an important question, yeah. which often comes <laughs> right. up, and I'll let you enlighten our listeners on this question. Okay, try. And that is the question of what were the religious inclinations of Luth bin Yahya, of Abu Mikhnaf? In other words, you know, you know, was he a, a, a was a, he a Shia or not? Standards, to be very card carrying Shi, ah, you, uh, <laughs> you know, the the full isma and everything that goes with our understanding of the Imam. I, I don't know if we can answer that question decisively, but there's no doubt that he's a person with wala. In the general sense of the word Shia, that has some inclination, which we find in the early texts, that we can conclude. Yes, that w we can be sure of because. That was a term of abuse among the muhaddithin. That, you know, he's a Shi'i, or a stronger word would be Rafili. That would be enough to disqualify a person. And that's really the reason they're disqualifying uh, Abu Mikhnaf, saying, you know, this is all just, you know, we, we can't rely on his reports. Which and many, the question and many why of these Kathir early did. recorders and narrators, <laughs> yeah. they were people who were gathering akhbar. Yeah. It didn't necessarily have to be something that, you know, they believed in theologically. 
Yeah. For example, we have the case of, you know, in many of the traditions within the Kitab al-Maghazi, for example, that have uh, shows some traditions which are positive to Ahlul Bayt and some which aren't necessarily so positive to Ahlul Bayt alayhim was salam. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And there's this really important book, the um, the Maghazi, Kitab al-Maghazi of Ma'amar bin Rashid, Rashid. Uh, also edited by Sean Anthony. And of course, that's, that's extracted uh, from the... Uh, Musanif ibn Abi Shayba, and so there's pro what we would maybe call pro Shi'i material as well as as um, pro Shi'i material in the other sense, Shi'a Uthman, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, if you want to say later Sunni um, Sunni Jama'i, if you like, yes, uh, yes. Uh, inclination. Um, but yeah, so this question, which I just alluded to a moment ago, this problem of tragedy. I think uh, that might be worth revisiting at this point. I think that, 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 you know, we find a lot of people, they'll say, well, the tragedy of Karbala, there's even, you know, books in English with that title. Um, yeah, I think it was Sayyid Mohsen Naqwi, Rahimallah, who has a book, The Tragedy of Karbala. And, and in full transparency, he was a close friend of mine. And I remember discussing with him, I said, well, you know, if you if if you use the word tragedy, you know what do you exactly mean by that? And if we look actually in the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the hujja <laughs> for Al-Kalam matters of English, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, lisan al Inglizi, lisan al Inglizi, it should be called like lisan al Arab for Ibn Mandur by Ibn Mandur. So, um, tragedy. In uh, volume, this is the OED, volume 18, page 360, middle column. So there's this usual etymological stuff, and then there's definition one. A play or other literary work of a serious or sorrowful character with a fatal or disastrous conclusion. All right, so first of all, this is something that really happened. It's an historical event. What it means is obviously contested between various groups of Muslims. But it's not a literary, it's not a play, it's not a fictional work. A maqtal is a literary work, especially, it could be seen as a literary work, especially the, the type that, like, Rawdat al-Shuhada in Persian, or Hadiqat al-Su'ada, or Al-Malhuf by, in Arabic, by Radhi al ibn Tawus. Um, then there's another sense about ancient Greek literature, ancient Latin literature, which is irrelevant. And if we go to the second one, it says, that branch of dramatic art which treats of sorrowful or terrible events. So again, it's not a dramatic art, but we are talking about sorrowful events, terrible events, in a serious and dignified style. Number three, it says figurative, an unhappy or fatal event or series of events in real life. And that's the way that they use the word, generally. Whether they know it or not, people who speak of the tragedy of Karbala, I would say it's probably, you know, OED definition number three the figurative usage, an unhappy or fatal event or series of events in real life, a dreadful calamity or disaster. Now, in ancient Greek literature, you know, there was tragedy and opposed to that was comedy. Um, So clearly there's this notion of a sad story. But if you are familiar, as many people who educate educated people in the English speaking world are, they're familiar with tragedy, uh, Shakespearean tragedy. And that's a sense we really want to not imply in our usage and make it clear. Absolutely. Because in in Shakespearean tragedy, you have a tragic hero. And now we need to also discuss the word hero. That's a word which needs to be visited. Precisely. So the tragic hero, you know, the the protagonist of Shakespeare's play, always has some flaw, Uh, which is his downfall. And an Achilles heel, as they say. An Achilles heel. And Imam Hussein alayhi salam uh, doesn't have any of that. Ah, he's a ma'asum imam, an infallible imam. He is imam. an infallible imam. So he has no flaw. If anybody is flawed and terribly, terribly, terribly flawed, and tragically in that sense, it's maybe... the one who opposes the is imam. the one who opposes the imam. So uh, we have to be careful when we use words. I think words are very, very important. And um, I tend to avoid the use of the term tragedy when referring to what happened at Karbala for this reason because of you know the possibility of of giving the sense that it's that it's used in Shakespearean tragedy 
Um, but also from the point of view, and I spoke about this recently in a series of lecture majalis. There were more sort of lectures, but there's a majlis element, which I gave recently uh, to a private uh, group, but uh, we're gradually uploading those. And there was a series of six lectures. And in the sixth one, we get into this, that yes, what happened at Karbala was was terrible and it was sorrowful, but there's another element. There is another element. There's there is another element there. There is an there is an element of you know if if we if you take that as 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 a, a military event, and therefore military is of course associated with battle with war. War brings out the worst and the best in people. And I am always reminded of that statement of 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 uh, of Zainab Aqilat Bani Hashim, alayhi salam. Salam, when, when, when Yazid is uh, tormenting her and uh, sorry, taunting her, and she says, I saw naught but beauty. So there is a profound understanding of Ar Rida on the part of Yahl Bayt and um, Ar Rida bil Qada, you know, contentment with the decree of heaven, as, as well as um. The perfection of Ubudiyya and servitude and certitude. And it really shows Karbala is beyond just a historical narrative, that we should not fall into the trap of historicism, historicism. when it comes to Karbala. Ahsantum. Exactly. Exactly. So there is that element as well. So in that sense, in, on, if you see things on that level or aspire to see on that level, then the sorrowful element, which is still there, and there's a ritual mourning, but you see that there is another uh, more even more profound message within that. Exactly. I mean, I remember the lines from Ziyaratul Arba'in of Sayyid al-Shuhada, where it stated that, you know, describing the stand of Imam al Hussein, it says, لَيُسْتَنْقِدَ عِبَادَكَ مِنَ الْجَحَالَ وَحِيرَةِ الدَّلَالَةِ وَحِيرَةِ الدَّلَالَةِ To save the servants of God, with the creation of God from ignorance and from the confusions of misguidance. So it really shows that Karbala is much more than this. But yes. returning back to the discussion that we were having in terms of linguistics and defining the term hero. Yes, in the notion of a hero is again something which is, you know, we're speaking the English language, you know, what's the etymology of the word hero? There's some, some I would, you know, I'm not an expert on Indo-European linguistics, so I couldn't tell you for sure. But um, if we can Consult the origins of English words, a discursive dictionary of Indo-European roots, uh, roots, excuse me, by Joseph T. Shipley, published 1984 from Baltimore and London to Johns Hopkins University Press. According to him, the word hero is derived from an Indo-European root. And mind you, the pronunciation here is just reconstructed. It says K-L-E-U, Kleu, which means to hear or to hearken. Yet, there is also the association with another word, um, which is um, U-I-R-O, Uiro, meaning man and the vital force in man. Um, so, I mean, there's, that's a kind of an etymological exploration. But from what we can tell, at least according to Shipley, there is no ancient Indo-European word meaning hero. Hero, as we understand it now, is a creation, we would, I would say, of, of, of Indo-European literary traditions. <laughs> and there is another really interesting book called Indo-European Poetry and Myth by M. L. West. This is a fascinating guy. I met him once. And he's a very learned man. And he was giving, actually giving a lecture on Zoroaster. <laughs> I'm and sure that was interesting. It was a fascinating lecture, you know, at, at, um, at uh, SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. I was, I was in London, uh, you know, doing some work at the Shia Institute, and this guy was giving a lecture, so I went to see, hear his lecture, and I, you know, just greeted him afterwards. But, uh, you know, he had the luxury of, of uh, having this cushy job of being a research professor. Which means he had he didn't have to teach anything, just research all the time at All Souls College, Oxford, and he he wrote this book called Indo-European Poetry and Myth. And 
So this notion of the hero is very important in Indo-European literatures and myth and mythology. But, you know, the event of, Ima- the event of Karbala is not a myth in the sense of, of a fictional uh, event a pu- or a purely fictitious narrative. Again, this is the OED, second edition, volume 10, uh, myth, page 177, column 1. A purely fictitious narrative usually involving supernatural persons actions or events and embodying some popular idea concerning natural or historical phenomenon. So the event of Karbala is not a fictional narrative. It's not, it's not something that, that didn't happen. It happened. And yes, we believe there were mirac- miraculous, you know, there's a miraculous dimension. I, uh, I would say some spirit, you know, that is there, but it's not uh, a fictitious thing. There's no fictitious or imaginary person or objects or uh, elements in what took place at Karbala. And in this regard, it's important to remember, if one refers to the Greek-English lexicon, with revised supplement by H.G. Little and R. Scott, published by Oxford University Press, that the original linguistic meaning of the word myth in ancient Greek is simply to speak. So it's some sort of a spoken account account. of something. Um, So then the sense of hero is not a mythological sense. Um, But there are things in common with maybe mythological heroes. There's a beautiful book uh, on on mythology called The Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell, published by Princeton University in the Bolligen series. It originally came out in 1949. It's been reprinted many, many times. And uh, he tries to give a, uh, a description of what is meant by the term hero. Let's see, I think that's page 30. He says that a hero, it is page 30, ventures forth from the world of common day. That's how he says it, of not the common day or just the world of common day, into a region of supernatural wonder, Fabulous forces are there encountered, and a decisive victory is won. The hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow boons on his fellow man. Now, in the context of Imam Hussein, of course, it's not a fictitious, it's not a myth. And he does venture forth from, let's say, mundane reality. Because he's leaving Mecca, he's leaving that whole world behind. And he, he leaves mere historical time behind. He enters into the domain of hiero history, sacred history, which transcends time. And that's why the message of Imam Hussein it makes him eternal. is always, <laughs> it makes him eternal. And I would say, yes, a decisive victory is won. We believe that at Karbala, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, was victorious. And that's another reason that the Yazidians and the later day Yazidi party would like to cover up this whole event and cause us to forget it. Because when you are humiliated, you don't want mm. people to know of your humiliation. And if you are a fake and a fraud, you don't want the people Absolutely. who are the real thing to be to be noticed. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is why the Prophet says, Inna al-Husayn misbah al-Huda. That he is the lamp of guidance, and in that time period, Mashallah. the misbah would be in a niche, that lamp, and they would use it to expose a thief if he was coming into ah, the house. Sentum, ah, sentum. And in this way, the movement of Imam Hussain is exposing what Yazid was doing at that precisely, time. Precisely, precisely. But then, like, when Campbell goes on to say, the hero comes back from this mysterious adventure with the power to bestow, bo- bestow boons on his fellow man. Imam Hussain, paradoxically, he doesn't come back. It's the yeah, horse absolutely. that comes back. Uh-huh. Absolutely. The lone, you know, the, 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 the riderless horse. But Imam Hussein, alayhi salam, miraculously, we're still talking about him today. And in that sense, he confers a, a, a baraka through, you know, through the remembrance of him. And even those who remember him, they gain honor by remembering Imam al Hussein. That you look at somebody like Muinuddin Chishti. Ah, if people don't remember example. any other line of poetry, because he didn't write one line, they know Shah Ast Hussein, Bad Shah Ast Hussein. Exactly. So we see that, you know, blessings are given by the Imam in many different angles. And so in that sense, Imam Hussein is 
a hero. So if we look at the Oxford English Dictionary, 2nd edition, volume 7, page 171, middle column, hero, you have the usual etymological notes, and then it says A-N-T-I-Q, you know, antique usage or antiquarian usage, a name given, as in Homer, so that would be the Iliad and the Odyssey, to men of superhuman strength, courage, or ability, favored by the gods, at a later time regarded as intermediate between gods and men and immortal. Number two, which is in the next column on the right, a man distinguished by extraordinary valor and martial achievements, one who does brave or noble deeds, an illustrious warrior. Number three, a man who exhibits extraordinary bravery, firmness, fortitude, or greatness of soul in any course of action or in connection with any pursuit, work, or enterprise, a man admired and venerated for his achievements and noble qualities. Four, the man who forms the subject of an epic. And the tale of Imam Hussein is indeed an epic tale. Uh, it goes on to say, the chief male personage in a poem, play, or story, he in whom interest of the story or plot is centered. So in that sense, yes, Imam Hussein is a hero, but not in any sort of modern sense where all sorts of extremely unworthy individuals are regarded uh, in some bizarre modern sense as being heroes. Uh, celebrities, sports figures, uh -huh. captains of industry. So I know we came into this episode with high hopes of discussing <laughs> different uh, maqatil and, you know, there's all sorts of works of hadith which include the narrative of Karbala, such as the Amali of Sheikh al Saduk or the volume mm. in Biharul Anwar. Yes. But perhaps an important question to address right now yes, yes. is that what was the role of the maqatil literature in forming a distinct Shi'i identity? And more general, the role of the martyrdom of Sayyid al-Shuhada. And perhaps that would be a good place to conclude this discussion. And if there's interest, we can have further discussions about the Maqatil literature. I think that the Maqatil literature are absolutely fundamental in the commemoration of the event in the sense of keeping it alive keeping memory of it alive and transmitting it from generation to uh, generation. And um, especially the maqatil of the more literary form, not uh, historical, there's a great poetic element. I mean, actual poetry, shi'r, involved in that. And there's also rhymed prose, especially mm. in the work known as al-malhuf, uh, and we um, saw the imams encouraging poetry in the sense that Debel al Khuzai, for example, he has his famous ode, Madarisu Ayatin uh, Khalat Min Tilavatin Ila Akhirihi. Naam, naam. Uh, and yeah, so there is this poetic element. There is, there, and there's all sorts of po poetical statements. Mm -hmm. Like when in, in the Maqtal of Abu Mikhnaf, it says that at the end, when, when, when the caravan reached Medina, they, someone came out, I forget his name now. And, used to, and, and, and Imam Ali Zayn al Abdul Islam says to you know, go back into Medina and announce in poet, poetry. Uh, Bishar or Bashir. Bishar or Bashir. And he says, Ya ahla yathrib la maqama lakum. Qad qutil al Hussein fa adzmu'i midraru. Exactly. So I think that this tradition, which is, which you cannot sever from, from the Maqatil tradition, and that's the tradition of Marathi. Yes. And maybe yes. we should do a whole discussion uh, about Ritha as a genre in, in Arabic poetry because it predates Islam. There's the famous Ritha, you know, Khansa, the great pre-Islamic yes, yes, poetess, yes, yes, yes. woman female poet, uh, you know, immortalized the memories of her, her slain brothers. And, so and we forth. have uh, Sayyid al-Radi, who has a famous work as well, which uh, Suzanne Statkevich writes about, an Indeed. article about. In the Journal of Arabic Literature. Yes, yes, yes. So I think that that's also a very important aspect and, and, you know, in, in, in terms of the miraculous or supernatural phenomenon, which also took place uh, in, in these different maqatil, we hear that, you know, a voice was heard from the heavens or the jinn yes. were heard to be mourning Imam Hussein alayhi salam in, in poetic form. Yes, or the malaika came to the imam in his support. But even there, aside from any so-called supernatural or miraculous uh, uh, elements as well, even in the purely historical accounts, uh, the, the more historical maqatil, when people go out into battle, 
And interestingly, this is also there in Indo-European heroic myth. The hero goes and he he recites in poetry. Who you know? And they ask yes, you know the he, rajas. Rajas. And they ask you. So in the, in, in Indo-European myth, they would ask you know who are you? Say who you are. And this is again. So they go into battles proclaiming their loyalty and saying who they are. And interestingly enough, we have many cases of people going. And I talked about this in one of my lectures, claiming that they are on the Dean of Ali. Mm. Very interesting. Mm. And and there was a there was an opponent, in fact, who was um, who was captured. This was not at Karbala. This was in um, uh, was I think this was in Jamal, Battle of the Camel, and he he was pray you know he was he was reciting his poetry saying that he'd kill he killed three of Imam Ali's men on in the field of battle, and he was boasting that he had killed people who were on the Dean of Ali, and he was on the Dean of Uthman. And uh, and he's captured by Ammar, and he brings him to Amir al muminin and Amir al-Mu'mineen has him has has him beheaded because he said he the Dean of Ali is the Dean of Muhammad. So well, so, the, well, so this well, poetic well. element is also there. So I think that this poetic element, and I think that just the the as as a genre of writing that commemorates the event is absolutely crucial, and it's part and parcel of at least what in South Asian tradition is called azadari. In the traditional of the ritual mourning <coughs> for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And of course, we can't imagine the likes of, and I'm in no way an expert on Urdu literature, so I'm just saying this, but I, I think I'm, I, I don't think I'm wrong about this. We cannot imagine the likes of Anis and Dabir, the famous Marciago, you know, the po poets, the, the, the Marcia writers, without there having been preceding them historically a maqtal, a body of maqtal literature that, that, that has the events and provides the raw material, so to speak, for them to, poet, to, to versify and present in the form of poetry. And I think that's true all the way across. And um, in that sense, then, I think Abu Mikhnaf has, and his maqtal in particular, an have extremely a important role. Have a tremendous, a tremendous, not just role, but a tremendous. Uh, I, I, I would think. Rank and status. Uh, in the world to come, fil akhirah as well, because they have kept the this alive. alive. And we must never forget the statement. Rahim Allahu man ahya amrana. Imam Rida, May the mercy of Allah encompass the one who revives our cause, our message. And I don't think there's anything further to say after the hadith of the Imam. So with that, Sadaqa Waliullah. Uh, Sadaqa Waliullah. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope our discussions were beneficial. My name is Sayyid Bilal Rizvi, and of course, we had the esteemed Dr. Sayyid Nizamuddin Ahmad. Thank you. Thank and you. this was our first episode of Kashkul Colloquia Islamica. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.